So my name is John Lavis. I'm one of the co-leads of RISE. Today's webinar is about collaborative governance for, for Ontario health teams, and we have a superb uh, group of people online to present. Um, and I see that we actually have two people from advance, a Ross Baker, um, uh, and I'm pretty sure I saw Paula Blackstein Hurst, yes, uh, which is great. Uh, we also have Alison Costello from the Implementation and Supports Branch of the Ministry of Health, and then we have two panelists, um, Andrew, from here on Perth Health Alliance and Georgia uh, from the Mississauga and Terry Health Team. So you'll hear their direct experiences with the things that we're talking about today. So I just have a few slides just to um, set the context from the RISE perspective So um, and, and more generally from the, the provincial perspective. OHTs, as I'm sure all of you know, require a different approach to governance than most partners are used to having. Um, I, mean, I have the great privilege to, in, in one of my other roles, to be the chair of a board that is working with, um, I think, seven other boards on an initiative that is requiring us to go through this exact same process. It's not related to OHTs, but we have been stealing ideas um, from all of you, and we've been using the CDMA agreements, and it's given me a feel for uh, what all of you are working through. So. That's been helpful, but we continue to learn a lot from uh, OHTs directly about their experiences in this area. So how we have defined collaborative governance in RISE is a governing arrangement in which leaders from organizations drawn from multiple sectors engage in a collective decision-making process and one that is deliberative, consensus-oriented, and directed to the achievement of a shared goal. Sorry, there's a typo there. It should be achievement. Um, these arrangements are going to look different uh, in different OHTs, and we expect that they will evolve over time as trust increases, new partners are, are added, or the requirements of collaboration increase. And if I just draw on my personal experience these days with these other boards that I'm working with, um, we have focused on the trust piece first, and we're just having preliminary conversations initially about some of the key parts of the CDMA uh, and taking gradual steps that will eventually get us to um, a signed uh, uh, collaborative decision-making arrangement. So uh, choices about end states where we will ultimately end up um, as individual OHTs aren't needed now. This is about how do we take steps towards that end state. So we use the term collaborative decision-making agreements or CDMAs um, uh, throughout this um, presentation. Uh, they need to be in place ideally so that OHT members themselves understand their and others' commitments to the OHT and they can hold one another accountable for these commitments. Um, but each OHT also has to fulfill an obligation to the ministry to have an agreement in place among its members and have a mechanism to receive a one-time implementation funds, and these CDMA, CDMAs accomplish that. So we've heard many times from the ministry uh, that their view is that collaborative decision-making arrangements need to be self-determined and fit for purpose. So uh, individual OHTs um, have the leeway to set these up in ways that make sense to them and suit the particular goals that they're trying to achieve. So the requirements as laid out uh, by the ministry are that these agreements uh, have to address the following elements. They need to talk about how resources get allocated, including these um, one-time implementation funds, uh, information sharing, financial management, uh, how you will discuss inter-team performance, how you will discuss performance within the team, dispute resolution, and conflicts of interest. Um, and the CDMA needs to be informed by and provide for the participation of patients, families, and caregivers. So you'll know that one of the eight building blocks of Ontario Health Teams is patient partnership and community engagement. And that first piece, the patient, family, caregiver engagement, needs to be explicitly articulated in whatever CDMA you land on. The community engagement piece of it needs to be articulated as well, both of those, again, building block number three. Um, and there also needs to be a mechanism to engage physicians and other uh, clinicians. So um, those are pieces that ideally are part of um, the CDMA that you will eventually put together. Because um, every OHT uh, is or will be struggling with how to formalize their collaborative decision-making arrangements, 
we wanted to try to make this as efficient as possible for people. Uh, so we commissioned the law firm Borden Ladner Joffe, who uh, has had been doing a lot of work with Ontario Health Teams. Um, many of you will know Anne Corbett. Uh, just after completing these templates, Anne in fact left uh, BLG after many years as a partner uh, to join Ontario Health as their uh, legal counsel. So unfortunately, we no longer have access to Anne with her BLG hat on, but the good news is the system is benefiting uh, from her leadership in this new role. Um, and with um, and what Anne's team was able to do was put in place four templates that OHTs could um, use at their discretion and most importantly adapt to meet their needs. Um, and you'll see the list of the four, and on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about them. But the idea is very much that these are templates that can and, and ideally should be adapted by OHTs uh, to meet their context. And again, I mentioned my own personal experience. I keep coming back to them over and over again to understand what issues do we need to be discussing among board chairs uh, that will eventually need to uh, find their way into a CDMA. So we're we're working through issues and not getting bogged down up front in the paperwork, but using the CDMAs uh, to help structure agendas, and we will eventually get to the formal uh, CDMA. So these are the four templates that we have. The first two have broadly similar purposes. So the first one's purpose is to formalize collaboration among members and allow for a variety of long-term arrangements to be established in the future. Um, the second is an alternative and less formal style of the collaboration agreement. So you just would need to use one of these if you find one of the two of them helpful. The second one, in addition to being less formal in style, is particularly helpful for teams with larger memberships that may want to adopt a network or sector structure for representation and decision making. So that's explicitly uh, provided for in that particular template. Both of those first two, which again, you only would need one of them if you want to adapt um, a CDMA, both of them address the ministry's requirements for a governance structure, including um, family, uh, patient, and uh, uh, that should be, it's not FPAC, it's PFAC, uh, Patient and Family Advisory Council. Sorry, I, I got them in the wrong order. Uh, it also has to address the ministry requirement for information sharing and uh, dispute resolution. The third template, or second type of template, given the first two are variants, is the fund holder and indemnity agreement. And this, uh, the purpose of this one is to formalize the terms under which one OHT member is designated as the fund holder on behalf of the OHT. So this agreement then meets the ministry requirements for how you will allocate resources and how you will manage finances. Then the project agreement, uh, its purpose is to formalize the terms under which OHT members collaborate with other members or external organizations on a particular project. And then this is the one that has the least detail because the real meat of it is specific to the project and those details would then be described in additional schedules that are attached to the, pro uh, to the agreement. Uh, issues like conflicts of interest and dispute resolution are handled explicitly and in a more formal way here because the view of Anne and her colleagues and their experience was those types of issues tend to come up more at the level of projects than they do at the level of uh, the broader collaboration. So that's why those pieces are particularly visible in those templates. So that's a quick run through of um, the RISE perspective on this and the templates that are available. We'll come back at the end to see if you have any questions about these. Uh, but now I'm going to turn it over to Ross and Paula to talk about the advanced program. So Ross and Paula, over to you. Thanks, John. And uh, thanks to you and the RISE team for the invitation for us to speak to you about the advanced program for OHT leaders. Uh, the program is focused on authentic collaboration, shared leadership, decision-making and accountability. Uh, and it's part of the broader uh, central support structure created and funded by the Ministry of Health. So Paul and I are gonna share this presentation and I'll start providing you with a summary overview of some of the key issues facing leadership councils and provider organization boards around governance and leadership. And this is based on our experience this fall in delivering the program to the first cohort of OHTs. And I'll describe the OHT program details and the collective impact framework, which has helped to inform our efforts. 
Paula will then go on to describe who should attend these sessions and what you can expect to learn from your participation in this series. So the next slide uh, really uh, gives us a sense of the issues. Am I, am I forwarding the slides, John, or, is, or is, are you? Okay, there we are. Um, next slide here gives us a, a, a brief summary, a high-level summary of some of the issues of, of, for Ontario health teams in terms of leadership and governance. And we all recognize that the success of OHTs rests on their capability to design and implement effective integrated care for their targeted population. But that work relies in turn on effective leadership and governance to overcome the limitations that we've seen for many years in Ontario in collaborations within and across sectors. Um, so there's a, a big agenda of work ahead of us, um, and we need to think about what it's going to take to make that uh, collaboration successful uh, moving forward. And the first issue is around um, ensuring that people can work together effectively from different perspectives, different sectors, and different experiences. Uh, there are some long-term collaborations which have provided a solid basis for some OHTs to move forward, but many OHTs bring together individuals who've had limited and sometimes conflicting prior collaborations and often different views and aspirations. So success for these councils requires that leaders work together effectively and traditional hierarchical leadership structures and power dynamics between organizations can erode the necessary commitments to establishing and achieving a shared vision and shared plans. Thus, we believe uh, that shared leadership demands new skills for leaders who want to be successful in this arena. At the same time, it's important to note that many leadership councils, and we saw this in the first cohort, are feeling considerable pressures to move quickly and achieve results in the time frame, some of them set by the ministry and some of them determined internally. Um, these pressures can sometimes lead to less effective decision-making processes unless leaders understand the need to establish effective collaborative relationships and shared decision-making processes that allow full participation, equal voice around the table. In addition, uh, we've seen that leaders in some of these collaborations can struggle to clarify the expectations and commitments from the partner organizations, and this can slow their ability to identify the specific and measurable goals that are necessary for shared accountability moving forward in these efforts. In addition uh, to these leadership issues, there are a number of governance challenges. Some provider organization boards still have limited knowledge about OHTs and understandable concerns about their fiduciary responsibilities, both to their home organizations and to the OHTs. All of these issues and our understanding and interaction with OHTs over the last several months have contributed to the design of the advanced program, which is intended to give you skills and knowledge to address some of these leadership and governance issues and to complement the collaborative decision-making tools that John described just a few minutes ago. The next two slides really uh, overview the, the design of this program. And the first slide really talks about the modules that we've created on collaborative leadership, shared governance and accountability with the goal, as I just said, to give you the opportunity to understand, to learn and to reflect on the strengths and opportunities that you have to improve your collaborative leadership and governance, and to create a roadmap to inform more effective collaboration moving forward. We've designed six modules, which will happen in 2021 over a period of, of three months. And you can see the list of these modules, really starting with an overview of what the, what the foundational elements are, and then in turn looking at authentic collaboration, shared decision-making, shared accountability, the backbone, that is the common resources that you're going to use to help pull forward the leadership and then the operational issues in your OHT, and the development of this collaborative governance roadmap, which is both a synthesis and a plan uh, moving forward um, on these issues. In addition to the, the leadership module, the next slide gives us a, the, the elements of a second and complementary piece to this, because we believe that effective leadership often requires that people can participate in a collaborative fashion, and that collaboration is aided by individuals who are skilled facilitators or coaches. And so we're asking you to identify and nominate two individuals from your OHT who can join the Leadership Council and can participate 
either partly or fully in their role as coaches to help facilitate the work of the Leadership Council and to continue to remind people of the elements of effective collaboration, shared leadership, and shared accountability. Uh, we're setting up a learning program for these coaches. They'll participate in a community of practice, and they'll be mentored by experienced coaches on effective coaching styles and effective coaching practices. In the first cohort, we went through the modules without the, the coaches already identified and in place, but our plan for the second cohort is really, really synchronize these activities so those coaches can be part of this effort moving forward right from the beginning. So I want to now move on and just say a little bit about uh, the collective impact framework, which is one of the frameworks that we're using to organize our work. Um, this is a tool that has, uh, was developed about 10 years ago and has been used in a growing number of multi-organizational, often multi-sector initiatives, not just in healthcare, but in social care and other initiatives in both the U.S. and Canada. There are five key factors to this. The factors are listed on the slide, including the development of a common agenda, that shared vision and shared plan that provides a common path for you to move forward as a collective uh, leadership group. In addition to the common agenda, you'll need to create some shared measures. Agree on what will be your goals and how to measure those goals moving forward, uh, sometimes creating new measures or ex using existing measures. Mutually reinforcing activities, the contributions of each partner agency, both on the leadership table and the operational um, efforts that you're gonna plan and move forward on. And all those are aided by continuous communication in leadership and operational areas so that we can understand, identify issues where there's disagreements, build trust and transparency moving forward. And lastly, backbone support, which as I've mentioned is a critical piece of this. And in the evaluations that have been done of collective impact, backbone support along with a common agenda are critical early elements to ensuring the success of these kinds of collective impact uh, initiatives. The framework is both relatively simple and informative and helping collaborations to identify the investments and activities necessary for success. And its adoption has grown rapidly in a growing number of cross-organizational initiatives in health and social care in both Canada and the U.S. And we think provides a useful way to think about the key conditions that will influence OHT's success in designing and delivering integrated care. So I'm going to turn it over to Paula now, who will talk about who should attend these sessions and what we learn. Thanks, Ross. Uh, so who should attend these sessions? They are targeted to senior leaders who are members of the OHT Leadership Council, or others may term it the Steering Committee, those individuals who will be guiding the overall strategy and operations for the OHT. We ask that you attend with six to ten members of this senior group to enable reflective discussions among a critical number of your leaders. We'll be providing each module twice, and it's ideal for all members to participate on the same date, but if that isn't possible, you can split your membership across the two available dates. And as Ross mentioned, the advanced coaches, or if you have your own coaches or facilitators uh, to facilitate this type of conversation um, at your leadership council tables, these individuals are also invited to attend if they're not already a member of your leadership council. So then moving on to the next slide to share with you what you can expect to learn by attending the leadership, the, this leadership series. In our introductory module, we'll be exploring a range of governance functions that are both unique and more complex for leaders who are involved in these types of collaborations. And we'll talk about the importance of shared mental models as a foundation for building effective relationships. We also identify and unpack various tensions and power dynamics that are indeed surfacing at OHT Leadership Council tables and that can erode trust. We'll discuss methods for surfacing these tensions and then effectively managing conflicts that arise. This leadership series emphasizes the importance of process, not structure, for building relationships. In our second module, we'll provide strategies for ensuring equality of voice at the table to hear and value the perspectives of all partners, and we'll discuss key enablers for shared distributed leadership. Our third module identifies principles for making good consensus-based decisions 
and we unpack the different types of decisions that OHT leaders will need to make and who ought to be engaged in each type of decision. Our next module on shared accountability focuses on the importance of creating measurable aims and meaningful outcomes, and we share methods and tools for clarifying and overseeing the individual contributions of each partner to shared accountability in order to achieve the OHT's aims. Our fifth and last content-based module circles back to the importance of considering a range of skill sets as part of Backbone and the resources that are essential for leadership and operational Backbone support. The second focus in this module is the importance of and the continuum for creating dialogue between leadership councils and their respective provider boards. Each of these five modules delivers foundational principles as well as methods and tools that will facilitate the use of these leading practices. And importantly, there's a lot of time devoted to interactive discussion, both within your OHT groupings to support leadership council reflection, as well as mixed leadership groups to facilitate sharing of successes and challenges across OHTs. And then in our final session, OHTs are, as Ross mentioned, given the opportunity to reflect on a survey that includes 21 key processes and practices for effective and authentic collaboration that stem from the first five modules, and then create a roadmap for their OHT Leadership Council that, will in, that is intended to inform your further discussion and development in these areas. So that ends uh, this brief overview of the Advanced Leadership Series, and I'll pass it back to you, John. Fantastic. Wow, what a, what a fantastic suite of um, support you're providing. This sounds great. I've not seen you present it in this detail, so thank you very, very much, Ross and, and Paula. Um, so now we have the good fortune to hear from two Cohort 1 um, OHTs um, who have been working through some of these issues. First, we'll hear from Andrew, who's the President and CEO of the Huron Hearth Healthcare Alliance, and then we'll move to Georgia Whitehead, who's the Director uh, Strategy Management and Major Initiatives at Trillium Health Partners. So, Andrew, I see you're there. Can I turn it over to you, and I'll, I'll tee up your slide? I can see you're unmuted, Andrew, but so far I can't hear you. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, fantastic. Thank you, Andrew, okay, for joining I'm, us. Over to you. Thank you. I'm toggling back and forth between my computer and my uh, my smartphone, although it's a BlackBerry, so I'm regularly told it's not that smart. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's obviously a, a privilege to be involved in today's uh, dialogue, and um, uh, I was one of... Uh, uh, a number of players from our OHT who participated in the first cohort, uh, and I will uh, uh, give a major shout out to Ross and Paula and the team. Uh, we really found it um, value add, uh, helped us focus, helped us identify uh, areas where we needed to um, uh, spend additional time, uh, and uh, really I think uh, has moved this along nicely. Um, so what I was asked to do quickly is just talk a bit about our governance and oversight in our OHT, and um, I, I can't do this without a bubble diagram, and that's what you see in, in front of you. And um, just for some context, uh, we were one of the first wave uh, OHTs approved, and when the, when the original call came out, um, we put out a call within our region uh, because we wanted to go all in from the outset. Um, so we ended up submitting with around 70 partners. Uh, we uh, uh, went right to our fully attributed population. Uh, and uh, based it on primary care rosters um, uh, primarily. Uh, so in, in the model that you have in front of you, it, it takes that into uh, to consideration. So uh, a few key points um, from a governance perspective, uh, and I, I have to say it, it can be challenging uh, from a, a communication point of view in, in differentiating roles of OHTs versus roles of partners. And, so what we've been trying to do is highlight that governance rests with the partner boards um, and that the OHT takes its direction from, from them, not the other way around. Uh, so the structure that you see in, in front of you uh, kind of has two, two halves uh, to it, and I'll start on the, 
what I'm looking at the left half, which has the green uh, block, uh, the planning and priority setting, and the board-to-board -board reference group. So we've set up a structure that uh, helps set priorities that we want to bring forward uh, to our boards. Um, so we have our planning and priority setting group, which includes uh, representation from all the uh, key sectors uh, that are part of our uh, OHT, uh, including patients and, and caregivers. Uh, and its mandate uh, is to uh, develop our strategic plan, including our annual uh, goals and objectives, which is um, brought forward to the partner boards uh, for uh, discussion and, and ultimate uh, approval. Uh, within that, we have uh, what you can see is a board-to-board -board reference group, and um, I, I will be, uh, you know, full disclosure, with, the, with COVID, um, we were derailed somewhat because uh, we were really focusing on face-to-face -face meetings, and that, uh, that obviously couldn't happen. Uh, so we're still um, in the uh, uh, workup phase for a couple of these things. So we've, we've continued with uh, what we thought was a very successful model uh, through the Southwest LIN uh, around board-to-board -board engagement. So we have, as we plan, we have a body of board members who uh, will come together, will discuss governance issues, will provide advice on how to engage uh, partner boards in, in, in proactive ways, will deal with governance issues more broadly, uh, but really uh, trying to make sure that uh, when we bring any plans to our partners, uh, they are fully versed in, in what, to, what to expect. Um, you can see on the sort of the right-hand side our red uh, dots. We, we're calling the sector advisory councils, and we've set them up for all of the uh, key areas that are represented in our OHC. Um, we recognize that not all the work that the sectors do relates to the OHC, so we've built on existing committees. So, for example, our long-term care group, which is there's 18 homes, uh, they have meetings already, uh, so we've simply tapped into that and have flagged that they will also, as part of their mandate, to work on the OHT priorities that are appropriate for their, their sector. So that group uh, is the one we go to to populate all of our various committees. Uh, so the planning and priority setting group that I mentioned uh, would have two representative, representatives from each of those sectors. The implementation committee, which is in the middle, which is kind of the doer committee once the plans have been approved by the boards. That's the one that supports uh, the various teams that are focusing on uh, objectives that we've decided are key for us. And on the schematic, you can see in the bottom, um, I love to use an acronyms, our three areas of focus are integrated infection prevention and control, uh, uh, CHF uh, with an emphasis on reduced readmissions to hospitals, uh, and mental health and addiction, specifically um, our partnering program with police and the impact that that has on uh, emergency uh, department visits. So our model is very much dependent on partner boards engaging proactively and supporting the activities of the OHT. Um, it requires a lot of trust. Um, we're a firm believer that we will sink or swim on the relationships that are in place, uh, and each partner recognizes that uh, they're going to need to put some some skin in the game, so to speak, for this to, uh, to work. Um, at times, it's a bit of a Rubik's Cube, uh, to be candid. Uh, some would say to go to 70 partners at, out of the gate is, is silly, uh, but we felt to truly advance this in the long term, the more players are involved from the outset, the more they can inform the process, the more they can ask questions, the more trust it's going to be developed, and the more success we're going to have in the long term. So that's a quick snapshot um, of kind of ours. Uh, I'm sure it's very confusing if people haven't heard of it before. It is a work in progress, absolutely. Our implementation committee is the one that's been meeting most regularly. Um, we're uh, working through the various agreements uh, as we speak. Uh, we have the CDMA in place. Uh, we've got the funding agreement in place. We have partner organizations contributing funding in addition to the Ministry of Health recent allocation. So, I think we're on the right track, but it absolutely is a significant shift in thinking, uh, you know, as we move forward towards in further integration. That's fantastic, Andrew. Thank you very much. I just have two quick questions before we pivot to Georgia. One has to do with the collaborative decision-making agreement. So you were approved a year ago. When in the last year did you get to that, and did you, did you develop one from scratch, or did you in any way build on the templates? And the other question relates to the size of your attributed population. We're about to go to the biggest attributed population, Mississauga. I think you're uh, closer to the smaller size. Could you just give us a sense of the population size? 
we're a population of about 150,000. Okay. Um, so, yeah, a little, little smaller than Mississauga. Um, yeah. But we we built it on uh, we built it on the what were the uh, Lynn subregions. So in our area in uh, Southwest Ontario, most of the OHTs that have been approved reflect what were the legacy uh, subregions. And in answer to the CDMA, we um, the ministry sent out a, a template in in their documentation, and we simply utilized that. Right. Uh, as our uh, as our driver, yeah. And and the timing, Andrew. When when did you get uh, that signed off over the last year? Do you recall when? Um, well, I must confess, I lose track of time. But um, okay, it, it was it was it was signed off. Um, I mean, our our funding agreement was signed off. Um, well, actually, yesterday I think was the day it was due. But the CDMA was probably a few months ago. Okay. Uh, there was a deadline requirement, and we submitted it along with with that. And we we had done a lot of work on vision and and uh, sort of goals as an OHT in advance of that. So a lot of the sort of check boxes uh, were already part of our initial submission. Excellent, super. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm sure there'll be questions for you uh, later. So thank you very much, uh, Georgia. Can we jump to you? So I think uh, your attributed population is something like 870 thousand. So. Uh, the biggest one that I know of. Um, I don't know if that introduces adis additional uh, governance and leadership challenges or not, but over to you. Thank you so much, um, and and thank you for that intro. And I think I think Andrew, you asked this question. And am I advancing the slides or is someone else? I can do it, George. If you just tell me when. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I'm good to go to the next slide because actually this is I, that is the point I would start with only to say, you know, it, it just changes um, and makes, uh, adds in some sort of different elements um, to what we had to consider um, as we went together and put together our CDMA um, in this process. And so maybe I'll start out by saying, uh, I'm gonna answer the questions, um, actually picking up Andrew on some of the things where you, you left off there, which maybe works well a bit. I'm gonna talk a little bit about who we are, some of the process we took to get there, and then get to the, so what did it end up looking like? And Andrew, you mentioned how crucial um, trust and relationships are in the development of how you make shared decisions. And so, you know, one of the other pieces I would, I would raise and share with you in terms of who the Mississauga OHT is in, in caring for a population of about uh, 900,000, we're looking at over 90 members um, or 90 partners. And this is an area where there has been a lot of population growth and maybe more than we would have expected as a, a, a population uh, several years ago. And as a result, it's challenging keeping up. And that has meant that the providers in the region have had to work together and find really creative ways of building new capacity and delivering care in new ways. And I think that the foundation of those partnerships historically were really important through the process, as was, and I'll, I'll sort of come to this as I go through a couple slides here, the application process and the work that we need to lay the foundation to get to the point of talking about how you actually make decisions together. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll go to the next, I'll go to the next slide and I'll base this in, you know, as we started this fall and we were approved as, um, as an OHT last, about this time last year. Obviously, we've all been very focused on support and respond to the COVID, and we actually use the relationships in our OHT to do that. And as in parallel um, to that, this fall, we embarked on then uh, putting together our collaborative decision-making arrangement. And we really started it, and, and Advance was very helpful in grounding everyone in understanding this is how we're actually making shared decisions and focus on that purpose um, before you spend too much time on form. And so before we really got into even the templates from the ministry and supported by BLG, which we found very, very useful and built off of those as well, 
um, we started with are we aligned and, and our understanding of the shared vision of where we're going, the um, values and our commitment to how, what our standards are and how we're going to behave and the principles by which we're going to make decisions. And those more we actually acknowledged up front to say more than agree, an agreement and governing by an agreement. This is actually about these foundations, us agreeing to them, having shared understanding and living up to those that are the glue that help us through challenging moments. Um, and so if I go to the next slide, and I, I'm going to go through a few slides here, I mostly share them just as examples for how we worked through putting together our CDMA. And so these are some examples of the, these are our guiding principles that really came out of the application process, conversations with partners, um, patients and families. And I think we felt that as we get into difficult decisions down the road, we're able to come back and really anchor ourselves in what we've agreed to in terms of how we're going to make choices. Um, go to the next slide. Um, and so some more examples here of uh, focusing on distributed le leadership, building trust, transparency, um, achieving results managing change thoughtfully and I just uh, include here a bit of a wordle that our partnership group put together at our recent meeting um, in in making sure that in actually bringing to light and sharing with one another in a difficult the difficult time that we're in uh, what we really value about being an OHT and what we're able to deliver on together and I think keeping this at the forefront is something that um, will help us live what's embedded as the foundation of the collaborative decision-making arrangement. If we go to the next slide, so these really formed the foundation then of everything we pulled through. One of the things in reflecting on the question we received, you know, what are some challenges and things that you had to work through? You know, then you get really into the template of thinking through, okay, how are we gonna make decisions? Is it voting? Is it consensus-based? What does that mean? I would um, share actually in support of the information that came from advance, we also used a tool uh, by James Madden um, called a practical guide for consensus-based decision-making. It's something that we found, we shared it out with the partners. It talks a lot about what consensus-based decision-making is, what it, what it isn't, um, and so, and, and some of the benefits to it over uh, going right into, for instance, a voting approach. And we, so for instance, you know, consensus-based decision-making coming from a premise that everyone's voice is worth hearing and that all concerns coming from a place of integrity are valid. Um, it acknowledges that if you, uh, going first to a voting process sometimes means that you may not actually have the conversations that you need to work through issues. And it, consensus doesn't mean that everyone necessarily, that would have been their first choice, um, but that people can walk away supporting the decision that was made, believing and understanding the due process and that the risks related to it were understood and, and tabled and, and are being managed. And so it doesn't mean necessarily that you don't use voting, but just that they, it is actually the process of decision making that helps um, you move through those challenging moments, build trust, build strength as you move forward. So we spent a fair amount of time on this, and we really built this part out in, in, our, in our CDMA. If we go to the next slide, one of the things that we found very helpful was to actually draw on examples and have shared conversations around, when have we done this before? And can we use a example of where it has worked well to set the bar for us on what it's gonna look like in the future? And for this specific example, we went back to the application process because I think we all acknowledged as, a, you know, as 90 partners, we made a lot of decisions in putting together our application. And we chose, for instance, among all of the many needs and things that we have to work on, the priority populations. 
And so we went back and we looked at a little bit around how did we make that decision um, and drew out some of those key features so that we could come back to this and use it as an example. And I would say it helped support uh, the leaders in um, recognizing and having an example of where they had already lived this. Go to the next slide. So who actually is at, um, in a partnership of that many partners, um, not everyone can be around the table at the same time. And so the approach that I think has been taken by us, as well as several other larger OH is the network structure. Um, and I, I think that was alluded to um, elsewhere as well, where, you know, between acute care and then within primary care and other sectors, you actually have a network structure that funnels into the collaboration council. Um, and, and each sector has a certain number of seats and they're involved in um, determining who sits in those seats. And that is something that we recognize this is a journey. And we have our members who initiated the application process and have championed it at the collaboration council table. And part of the mandate and embedded in their collaborative decision-making arrangement is that we will actually evolve our structure to the network structure. And so that is work of the next year. Um, and recognizing that our work is, will be bifocal in terms of clinical work and governance work um, because it is very much an evolution. If we go to the next slide. Here's, a, I'm gonna share a little bit of just the structure um, of what the governance looks like. Next slide. Oh, I've got another another slide in here. This is really just to give you an example of what the sector network looks like. Um, and so the primary care teams um, in Mississauga have come together and formed the primary care network, which has elected a chair who now sits on the collaboration council um, as an example. Next slide. So this is what the uh, sort of high level uh, view of the governance structure looks like and really focusing on how we make decisions. It's a collaboration council, uh, a chair is council that we are will be building out, a clinical care council that we'll be, we will be building out this year as we continue to build our governance structure. A small office, right now it's just a, a person, but we will have um, sort of folks to really be able to support and build this out and our partners embedded at all levels. And I really liked Andrew in your diagram being very clear on how the partners and the sector networks feed into the collaboration council. And uh, we were very clear and, and supported with toolkits, conversations with boards on helping them understand this is not um, in any way, it does not change the governance accountability of any one partner and any partner who is signed out at the collaboration council, the CDMA governs their system stewardship and the mandate to advance the OHT of which partners are, evolved, are involved and are almost um, the shareholders of. So I'll go to the next slide and I think a little bit on process. I think we've talked about this. We can go past to the next slide. Um, this is really just to say it's a journey and we recognize that it's taken us a long, uh, a lot of work to get to this point. The application process and the supports have been helpful in readying us for that, building on a history of partnership. Um, but we know there's a long way to go. And, and I know uh, RISE and Advance and Teams would be the first to say it, other countries that have embarked on integration journeys say, you know, after five and 10 years, we are, we are still pushing the envelope in realizing results. It is a long-term um, journey. And so this is just to acknowledge that um, and know that it's an evolution. And so building in, when are we going to look at um, and refresh and evolve um, what we've put in place has been important as a part of it. And that's all. Fantastic. Thanks very much, yeah. Georgia. 
I, I, I first read that as the last cough and flu clinic, and then I realized it was launching the cough and flu clinic. But that itself is an innovative model, I think, because it's a primary care-led uh, response to COVID-19 in your community. Is that right? It is. It is. It's really recognizing that there there is, in some instances, a gap for in-person symptomatic care that is not um, in the emergency department just due, you know, while primary care is open, just due to some offices not being uh, IPAC friendly. And so this gives a place that's knit in with the and supported by the entire primary care community um, for patients um, or people without a physician to go. Yeah. It's a it's a great OHT response. Congratulations on that. So, Allison, over to you for some brief comments, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Thanks so much, John, and I will be sure to be brief. So, I wanted to thank uh, Andrew and Georgia for sharing um, their work uh, today, and I I had asked John if if I could have a little bit of time in, in the session today to really. Um, emphasize that uh, we know that this is an area that a lot of teams have a lot of interest in further discussion on. I think that there's a lot of interest in hearing from each other about how they've, um, you know, I, I'd say uh, on the whole from Andrew and Georgia, how they've approached their work. But I think we have um, a lot of interactions with team who are seeking to kind of troubleshoot a particular issue um, and we know that there could be a lot of benefit in hearing from other teams about how, in a similar situation, uh, they have approached it. So we wanted to um, just uh, try to emphasize that um, we really want to commit to an ongoing conversation related to CDMA. You know, we've, we've issued initial guidance that um, really did try to signal that we understand that OHTs are at the early stages of coming together. Um, and that the next phases of that advancement of CDMA will have a lot of nuance and uh, particularities related to um, unique community character characteristics, um, that there are particular elements that people are uh, specifically wanting advice on, like patient co-design or primary care um, involvement. Um, and we really do want to support kind of the ongoing conversation on this topic. Um, hopefully sourced from those areas that teams are most often wrestling with. Um, but in addition, uh, I think it's just great to hear from each other about how people have approached it. I think our reflection, um, uh, you're right, Georgia, it's about almost exactly a year, I think a year and a few weeks uh, since uh, Mississauga was the first team announced. And oh my goodness, is it ever incredible to hear the amount of work that has been uh, accomplished over that time uh, including through a pandemic, uh, we re we recognize how um, you know th the energy that teams have continued to put forward towards advancing their OHD and making sure that that momentum is not lost while they're um, managing the pandemic, and that it's really uh, creating a bit of an environment that's proving out what we hoped the very very future state promise would be of OHTs, and that realization I think is coming through uh, for a lot of people. Um, perhaps earlier than anyone could have anticipated, but not without its challenges and not without um, the need for more supports, more guidance, and more resources. So um, uh, I think our commitment is to uh, keep the conversation going and to really want to make sure that we uh, bring forward topics that are most helpful for teams so that uh, all of you that are on the line today uh, will continue to engage and continue to tune in. Um, if uh, you're really seeking the benefit of kind of that shared learning opportunity across teams. So thank you so much, John, for hosting and Carrie and team. Uh, and thank you, Andrew and Georgia, for your time. And Great. Ross. And yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Allison. So uh, one question just had to do with a, a team asking, do we need to use the BLG template? And so the answer is absolutely not. It is there for teams that find they are there for teams that uh, find one or more of them helpful, but no obligation to do that. The piece of the question that I actually uh, am surprised that I can't answer, so I'm going to ask you, Allison. Um, so the individual says, we use the original templates provided in the OHT toolkit, and that's now been signed off by the boards. That is not ringing a bell with me about what template there would be uh, that you would have provided. Could you just explain whether what I'm forgetting here, and does that template that the ministry provided tick the boxes that you require of the CDMA? 
Um, I, I'm glad you're asking it because I can't see what you're reading. Um, but I, I have a feeling that might just be a, um, a confusion between that RISE released it or that the ministry released it. And I, okay. I, would, I would assume it's the same templates that you released as we have not uh, uh, done our own. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. good to know. But, but, okay, so we're all on the same page. Great. I thought, how did I miss a template that came out from the ministry? So rest assured that, you know, those templates are there for you to use if they're helpful. And uh, the hope is that you'll adapt them as you see fit. Um, but if you have other approaches, uh, that's um, absolutely fine, as long as from the ministry perspective, you tick the boxes that they require for the CDMA. Uh, maybe this next question could go to uh, Ross and Paul. It's how do you distinguish the role of board members versus management and participating organizations and groups in building and implementing the teams? But uh, Andrew and, and Georgia, you may want to comment as well. Could we start with Ross or Paula? Do you want to weigh in on this? Based so I, it's Ross here. I'll start and maybe Paula can add. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of um, ambiguity about the uh, uh, the governance responsibilities and, you know, I think Andrew's approach, which is to say uh, that the governance rests with the partner organizations, and I, I see that in uh, Georgia's as well, is a good place to start. But as we go down the road of the development of OHTs, clearly um, the, the leaders, uh, the executive directors and CEOs that come from the organizations who are sitting on these leadership councils will also have um, a considerable input into governance level activities around strategy, around managing uh, the broad sort of relationships in the field. So it's an evolution, um, and I think that's uh, certainly the view of the ministry as well moving forward. At this point, I think uh, uh, recognizing there's a lot of work to do, it's really important both that leaders focus on creating um, a, a viable plan, that also we encourage uh, boards of partner organizations to understand what the goals and evolution of OHTs look like and how they can connect uh, with others around um, what other partner organizations are, are, are seeing and hoping for in the future. Paula, you want to add to that? Um, the only thing I would add is that we're not, um, as Ross said, we're not prescribing what the role of provider boards is versus the role of governance of the leadership council table, but what we do do is support various processes. So we provide, um, for example, um, the notion of a template that would allow the leaders around the table to agree on some consistency in terms of what kinds of information are they consistently bringing back to each of their boards so that all boards hear similar and consistent information um, and that there's transparency. And similarly, whether they can agree on what we call different types of decisions like big bet decisions versus other types of decisions and those which might require so that there might be some agreement across the leaders of what what requires board input and conversation and discussion versus what they all feel that they um, can decide together at their own governance leadership table. So, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Andrew and or Georgia may have other things to add. Great. Yeah. So, Andrew, Georgia, any reflections? Again, the, the question, you know, how do you think about the role of board members versus management um, in building and implementing the teams? Um, do you have any thoughts about how you've handled that within your respective teams? Georgia, do you want to jump in first? Sure. Uh, one of the other, one of the conversations we've had related to this is who populates the collaboration council. And Again, really starting with the function that we need that to serve and acknowledging that in at the coming back to make sure we're very centered on what we have been mandated to do is to create an Ontario health team to, to, to support the health of the, the community of Mississauga. And we know that in the early days, as putting this together, there are going to be even at a even at a board level, we think about that collaboration council uh, serving over time as as governors. There are a lot of operational decisions um, that need to happen, and a fair amount of ability to understand what's happening on the ground to guide it very practically. As it doesn't have a whole organization underneath it of leaders doing that. Um, and it is really of the partner providers. And so I think in understanding that we acknowledged 
um, a good amount of operational, but high, like strategic operational level people are required with strong tether to governors. And that's where we went with the chairs council um, to provide the leadership to lift this. And that each individual partner, whether at the collaboration council or engaged in regular meetings is then tacking back and supporting in conversations with their boards and bringing that forward to guide the direction through engagement. Great, thanks Georgia. Andrew, any reaction? Andrew, Andrew may have been called away. He may be muted. No, I'm, I'm oh, here, here can we you go. hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, as I said in my little talk, ours will sink or swim based on governance. And we, we've set it up so that in, on the planning side of our OHT, there's a mix of governors and, uh, and management, um, including a, a separate governance only uh, table. And on the implementation piece, once boards have approved um, the activities of the OHT, uh, the implementation is exclusively uh, management uh, or staff um, as appropriate. And, you know, in my particular case, just using my organization here in Perth Health Care Alliance, uh, my annual plan as president and CEO of that organization specifically includes some OHT deliverables. Um, so I'm held accountable directly to, to my board for um, uh, individual goals that, that reflect the priorities that the OHT has determined to be important in that particular uh, year. Very helpful. Good to know. Thanks very much, Andrew. And I apologize, I hadn't moved forward to the next slide. Um, the person who had posed the question about the templates, when they look back, they confirmed that they were the ones that we made available um, uh, through, uh, and they were developed by BLG and made available on the RISE website. So that's good to know. A question back to uh, Ross and Paula. Um, do you, have you been collecting these really helpful kind of visuals that we saw first from Andrew and then from Georgia that kind of show the structure of the different entities that are involved in uh, collabor uh, in governance and leadership um, as part of your work? Have you ever pulled them all in? Yeah, we have. We, we, we have been collecting materials from the organizations that, that uh, or the OHTs that participated in our work and uh, we've held those for, for our information, but uh, we could, we could certainly uh, direct people to the places that have shared with us uh, so that they can get access as well. Yeah, I think that would be fantastic. People often find it really helpful to just see different models and and to get themselves thinking creatively about what might work for their local community. So if that ends up being something that uh, you could share in some kind of form, uh, that would be great. So I think we've covered um, all the questions we're going to have time for. So I'm just going to uh, remind you of some upcoming um, sessions uh, and opportunities. So one is with an opportunity. As some of you will know, we're going to now start to call it the RISE Quorum online space. Quorum is the uh, old HQO, now Ontario Health Quality Division platform, and there is a, a RISE Quorum space specifically. So if you would like to continue a discussion around collaborative decision making, we're going to be supporting that through that online uh, community. Um, next thing is we have a series of webinars coming up. We're going to have Rob Reed on the 21st of January going through some of the key principles of population health management. We'll have uh, some senior folks from the Ontario Ministry of Health talking through digital health and e-services on the 28th of January. On the 4th, we're going to uh, zero in on patient, family, and caregiver engagement, both uh, the uh, strategy and a framework for doing that. Um, and all our materials, as usual, are available on the RISE website, but we also profile the, the excellent work of, of partners. Um, so just a quick wrap up. Thank you very, very much to our presenters today for joining us. We're very grateful uh, for your time. Uh, I'll just ask Ross and Paula if they'd like to say anything before we wrap up, and I'll give the final word to Allison. No, that's great, John. Nothing from me, thanks. Okay, thank you both for joining us. Allison, final words to you. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for uh, lending you, us your lunch hour and a busy time. And uh, thanks so much uh, to Rise and team for hosting a great uh, session.
Excellent. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. So I hope some of you get some rest over the holidays and uh, we'll pick up in the new year. So thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.